Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Fight and Fanatics Young Lion stream. I am uh, Candel, otherwise known as Koi, otherwise known as that guy who hosts Crayon Cup. Um, today we are here to learn all about push block. And when I say all about, I mean pretty much all about. I have just about every little detail that you could possibly need to know about push block noted down here. Trusty notepad. Wonderful program. If you ever need to take notes while playing a fighting game on PC, just open up notepad. You got everything in here. So, the main goal of the stream here is to teach you all how to use push block, how to play against it, all the little mechanics behind it, and answer any questions that anyone has regarding it. So, got my trusty control scheme here. Where do we start? I have me all these notes. Take a look here. So the most basic thing you need to know about push block is how to do it. I'm sure most of you know how to do push block by now, but for those of you who don't know, all you need to do, push block, to block an attack, and then hit two buttons while the block's done. It can be any two attack buttons, A and B, B and C, or A and C, or even all three if you really want to. That's how you do it. Very simple. Let me load my state here. The other neat thing about push block here is it only works, it will only happen if you are actually in block stun. And that's important to note down. That's an important mental note here. I have that written down right here. It can only be done while in block stun. If you press these attack buttons when you're not in block stun, you're either going to get an attack or a throw, depending on which button combination you use. Also, D doesn't count. You can't push block with D. I'm trying to do it with A and D there, and it's not happening. A and B works. A and uh, D do not. So it can only be done while block's done. That's important to note for later. And, you know, it's a universal defensive mechanic. Every character can do this. This is one of the primary defensive mechanics in the game. Universal defensive mechanics. Every character can do this, and it's clear that what it does is it pushes the opponent away. Execute it, pushes the opponent away. And the distance that they get pushed away actually depends on what type of attack you block. So here I'm going to set the dummy to push block. Dummy action, dummy blocking, always blocking, push block after the first hit. So the distance that you go, let me set a save state here that we can take a look at the difference in distance. I'm going to put Pap in the corner. That way we can get a pretty good understanding of how far away I'm being pushed. So here I'm going to do a light attack. And as you can see, it doesn't push me very far. Maybe about a character length up away. Just about. Now if I do a medium, I go back a little bit farther. And then if I do a heavy, I go really far. So you've got different push block distances depending on what gets push blocked. Also, if you push block an air normal, you go really far as well. I believe that's actually farther than C normals. Yeah. Let me actually hit that. It pushes you back really far if it's an air normal. And if you push block specials, it depends on the special. Different special moves will actually have different push block distances. So if I do that, I went about that far away, and then if I do this, it's about the same distance, but it usually depends on whether or not the special move has inherent momentum to it. So for example, Paprika has her cartwheel attacks, and if you push block them, she's not going to go very far because she continues to move forward after getting push blocked. 
All right, what else do we got here? This bit here. This is what I call push block stun, PB stun. When you push block, you are locked into blocking for 25 extra frames. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make, tap, do an attack, and then I'm gonna push block it. And then I'm gonna try to hold up afterwards. So when I hold up, I'll be jumping the instant I'm able to. Note that I'm holding up immediately after push blocking. Oop, I did it too early there. So you're locked into push block for 25 frames, and that is regardless of the block stun that the move would have inflicted normally. Because some moves only inflict, like, you know, 5 frames, he being the various projectile specials. Yeah, I can list that later. But, um, what was I saying? Some moves only inflict a tiny bit of block stun. So, like, a light normal only fix a little bit of block stun. But the opponent will still be stuck in push block stun for 25 frames, regardless of that. And some moves inflict a lot of block stun, like heavies. But they will be set into 25 frames of block stun, even if the block stun of the attack would have been longer than 25 frames. It overwrites the block stun of the move that you push block. Now, something that's important to note here... Well, well, we'll discuss that bit later. There is something regarding push block stun that I'll be talking about later. It's a very weird detail, but for now, all you really need to know is... All you really need to know is... The fact that it locks you in block stun for 25 frames here. Chip damage! Uh, if you didn't know, TFH has chip damage. I'm gonna set the dummy to do an attack that will do chip damage here. So, if you look at my health bar, it gets knocked down a bit by that attack there. Paprika's cartwheel C, special move, does 90 damage, 90 chip damage. Yeah, if you didn't know. Not everyone knows about chip damage. Or they might not know that it's in this game. But, uh, chip damage, that's a thing. But if you're in the middle of push block stun, it actually turns that chip damage into red health. Red health is the kind of health that regenerates over time, but if you get hit, you lose all the red health plus the damage of the attack that you got hit by. So, this allows push block to be used to negate chip damage in chip damage strings. Like, uh, if you're blocking a lot of projectiles at range, you can do that. And, even more importantly, is if you are below 300 health, 300 health, if you're below 300 health, chip damage is actually completely negated. By push block. So I'm gonna set the life bar, uh, let's say 7%. Yeah, no, it's gotta be 6%. I'm gonna go to 6%, then I'm gonna set it to normal, and then I'm gonna save a state. So now I am at 288 health. I am below 300 health. And what's gonna happen here is... Paprika is gonna do... Her chip damage string. Actually, let me put myself at health where a chip will kill me. Let me set myself to... Let's say... 2%? Nah, 1%. I gotta be at 1% health here. 1%. Here we are, 1% health. <clears throat> if I block Paprika's cartwheel C, I will die. So what I need to do here, if you see this, it, I don't have death allowed, but you'll see it knocks me down to 1 health. Magic pixel right there. What I can do is I can push block and that chip damage is completely negated. So without push block, that happens. I die. 
I'm, I'm, I would die in a normal game here. This would me be this would be me dying. But if I push block, and the chip attack hits me while I'm in push block stun, I lose no health whatsoever. So this is very important because it means that there are no guaranteed block strings into specials that will kill you. You can actually avoid chip cap, uh, chip kills if you block a move and then push block. Of course, it won't save you if they do a special move outright, because you have to block at least one move to even activate push block. But if they're trying to do a chip out block string, you can avoid dying. All right. This bit here is interesting. So if you push block, it will actually save your blocking direction. So the way I'm going to demonstrate this... Let me set the life bar back up a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push block a high attack and then let go of blocking here. And Paprika is going to do a high attack after I push block a high attack. So here we go. Like that. So I'm gonna block the high attack, I'm going to push block, and then I'm gonna let go of blocking. It still blocked it. It saved my blocking direction there. Now, if I were to do the same thing, only I were to say... Let me put Paprika in the corner so this is a bit easier. If I were to block a high attack, and then let go of blocking, and then she does a low attack, it would not work the same way. Oh, that was, that was a really nice recording on my part. Like that. So, here we go. I get hit by the low there. But if she did a high attack afterwards, I would block it naturally. So, it's important to know that... When you push block, it will continue to block in the direction that you blocked when you push blocked. So if you blocked high, it will keep blocking high for the entirety of push block. And if you're blocking low, it will keep blocking low for the entirety of the push block. Air push block. So if you push block something in the air, it will actually stall you in midair. As you can see, I am frozen in midair while push block is happening. Oh, nice. Don't. And then I fall down after push block ends. So that's a little uh, thing to note. Alright, this is the weird quirk that I was talking about earlier. Uh, block stun that overlaps with push block stun is reduced by 3 frames. Now what this means is, push block stun lasts 25 frames, right? Got your 25 frames. But let's say that there is a move. You you block you push block a move, your opponent does another move after that push block. And the second move's push block. Uh not no, the second move's block stun is longer than your 25 frames of push block stun. So you push block, you're locked in for 25 frames, you block another move while push blocking, and that second move actually extends your block stun longer than push block stun. Now what will happen is that second move will be treated as though it is a... Um, how do you say? As if it was instant blocked. Instant block reduces block stun by three frames. So I'm going to demonstrate this by making the dummy push block my move. So, well actually... To first demonstrate, I'll have to show you how unsafe this move is normally. So, Palms, Crouching B. It says minus 6 on the bottom there. It's normally minus 6. Right? You got minus 6. Negative 6 on block. Now, if I make Pap do a push block on my standing A, and then I immediately do Crouch B, Not immediately, slightly delayed. If I do it slightly delayed so that my block stun overlaps with push block stun, you'll see it actually becomes minus 9. 
So they're still getting affected by block stun from my second move. It's not like push block erases all block stun, but it makes it slightly more unsafe than it would have been otherwise. Normally that's minus six, now it's minus nine. Which means... Let's see, I actually had a block recovery option set here. That it can be punished now. So you, this is something that you might be able to use on defense if you recognize which moves become unsafe when they hit the latter part of your push block. Like, I'm trying to block this, I can't do it. Oop, I frame trapped on accident. But that is a, a little known quirk of push blocking. Not a lot of people know about that little mechanic where you shave off three extra frames of block stun if you block an extra move after push blocking. And that other moves block stun would go over the push block stun of 25 frames. A lot of, a lot of boring math stuff in this whole thing here. But that's pretty much all of the mechanics of push block. Press two attack buttons while blocking. You can't use the D button. It can only be done when you're in block stun. If you're not in block stun, you'll just whiff buttons or whiff a throw, and that's important to note for later. It pushes the opponent away, and the distance depends on what you push block. If it's a light attack, you'll go not very far. If it's a medium, you'll go medium distance. If it's a heavy, you'll go really far. If it's an air normal, you'll go really far. Not really the best demonstration there to be in the corner. There we go. It locks you into 25 frames of extra block stun. Just a quick rehash of this bit here. Chip damage becomes red life. Uh, I already did a big demonstration on that one. I don't think I need to do that again, but this is all just the basic mechanics behind it. So now let's actually talk about using it. Push block on defense. So this is the main reason you would push block. You just want the opponent to go away, right? You want the opponent to get off of you. you. Want the opponent to stop doing all this nonsense on you, right? You're like, go away, go away, go away, go away. I don't want you on me. Get off of me. Push block creates distance between you and your opponent, and therefore, uh, it is harder for them to mix you up. For example, Paprika's low attack there, it has a limited range. You can see, if I'm out of range, it's not really helpful. So if I push block her, and she stops there... Let me just record a new recording. Alright. Let's say I'm in range of Paps 2A, and I'm scared of the low. She keeps doing it. Now if I push block it, I'm out of range now. That's the most basic use for push block. You just want to get out of range of your opponent's mix-ups. If they keep mindlessly doing the 2A, I am out of range, and I am safe from that low threat. The other thing that is most commonly... The other thing that you most commonly use push block for on defense is to open up the opponent for whiff punishes. So I'm going to demonstrate this. Let's get Pap out of the corner here. Let's say Pap is trying to pressure me with a string like this. Let's say she's doing 5B, 5C. Well, that was a little bit too far, wasn't it? So let's go 5B, 5C. I'm in range of that. I don't want her to block uh, block string me. In fact, to better show this, 5C, 5C, cart A. Because cart A starts pressure for Paprika. She can start doing her free t-shirt overhead frame trap from that. So that's a good pressure starter. But I recognize that she is using a very whiff punishable move as the second part of her string. Let's say the pap keeps doing this string on me, and I recognize that she keeps on using 5C as her second move in her pressure string. So what that means for me is I know that 5C is bad on whiff, and I know that push block gives me extra distance. So my plan here is I can set to whiff. 
and I can get a whiff punish. Do that. There we go. So I can open the opponent up for a whiff punish if I recognize that they're doing unsafe moves to be whiffing. The other most common example of this, let's actually um, break out a new character here. Let's say I'm Oleander, I'm fighting Tianwo, and Tianwos often like to do a certain pressure string. A lot of Tianwos want to pressure into slide. They like to do their 2C on block. So let's say Tianwo is like... like that. So if they misjudge their spacing, and I push block... Let's see if I can get this to work. This happens pretty often in matches. Yeah, there it is. I can get a big punish on them for going autopilot on their strings. If I recognize what string they keep doing, and I recognize that they're using a move that is really bad to whiff, I can create a whiff punish scenario by push blocking the move before that. Now the unfortunate thing is that if I am push blocking too much, let's say I've got, you know, Tianwo's doing this, she's doing her her string, and she thinks that she has hit me and goes into launcher. Now, if I am too busy push blocking, I might miss my punish on their launcher, for example. If I push block the launcher, I can no longer get a punish on it. You sometimes see this, you sometimes see people like, for example, uh, like this. Oh my gosh, Oleander hit me with an attack from really far away. I want to push block to get her away from me. Oops, this move was unsafe. I could have punished it. This move is normally minus 11. But if you're not paying attention to the moves that you're push blocking, you might miss out on a punish. You see, down there it says I'm only minus 1 instead of minus 11. And that's because my opponent is push blocking me every time. If they were not push blocking... Let's see, push block, push block, push block. There it is. If they were not push blocking, I would be minus 11, and that's basically a free punish if I'm close enough. So it's important to, rem uh, to remember to be mindful of which moves you are actually push blocking. Because if you push block an unsafe move, you're missing out on free damage. Ah yes, push block is required to avoid fuzzy guard break. Now. If you don't know what Fuzzy Guard is, I'm going to give a brief explanation here. I'm going to set up a Fuzzy Guard setup on myself using Tianwo here. I didn't quite get it. There we go. So, basically, when you block a move, you are put in block stun for a set amount of time, and while you're in block stun, you are locked into the hurt box. If you see these green boxes, blue hurt boxes, you know, this box here. That's my hurt box. That is what the opponent needs to hit in order to do damage to me. When you block something, you're locked into this specific hurt box, or this specific hurt box, depending on what you blocked, until your block stun ends. So if I block a jumping normal, I have to have be blocking, I have to have been blocking high. And that means that I am stuck with this very tall hurt box. Now, normally, rising jump normals can't hit you when you're crouching. They can't hit overhead, because overheads require the opponent to be crouching when they get hit. And if you're crouching, you don't have the tall hurt box, which means that rising jump normals will usually miss. But, if I'm locked into this tall hurt box, that means that the rising jump normals can actually hit me. So I'm going to block this sequence from Tianwo, and I'm going to try to low block after the first jump normal, which is usually what you do when you block one jump normal. You're like, all right, now they can start doing lows on the ground, so I should probably switch to low block. 
So here's what I'm gonna do. You can see my hurtbox turned blue, or dark blue, which means I was blocking low. But my hurtbox stayed standing, which means that she could hit me with this rising overhead. So, this is a guaranteed 50-50, unless you push block. See, Tianro could do this unreactable rising air normal, or she could do an unreactable low attack, because both, both of them happen too fast for me to react to. So if I don't push block, I'm opening myself up to this 50-50. But, if I push block, I don't think I can punish this, but I am at least no longer stuck in that 50-50 scenario. So push blocking on defense is really important. Hope you didn't miss a lot of the stream. Uh, you missed the basic mechanics over you. Right now we're talking about how to use it on defense. Yeah, Fuzzy Guard is uh, a pretty obscure mechanic, but it's very important to know. Uh, most characters in this game can actually Fuzzy Guard you. I'm actually going to switch back to fighting Paprika here so that I can demonstrate another Fuzzy Guard scenario for you guys. Just to show that other characters can do this get my mouse off there. So let's say Paprika goes in on me with this string. Oops. I guess it has a different amount of block stun than hit stun. This is... Alright. Give me a sec to do this. So if I don't push block that string... This is what happens if I switch to low block. I get opened up. Yeah, even Velvican. Fuzzy Guard is not only from aerials. Um, technically, some overheads will hit faster. Like, for example, a lot of Tianwo's flip overheads, where she does 4D into, like, jump A or something like that. Those overheads actually are a lot slower because you're crouching. Like, it takes their attack some time to actually hit you crouching. There are several active frames that just whiff if you're crouching. So Tianwuho's 4D jump A is like 20 frames if you're crouching, but if you're not crouching, it's like 16 frames or something crazy like that. So if you block an air normal and then she does that overhead and you don't push block, you are probably going to get opened up if you switch to low block. So it's important to know for a lot of reasons. A lot of overheads hit faster on crouching opponents, like this one. This one hits standing opponents on frame 23, but um, it hits crouching opponents on frame 25. So that two frame distance or difference can be caused by fuzzies. If the opponent has some kind of good fuzzy setup, they can actually make their overheads hit faster. So push block is how you avoid this 50-50. Oh, I, I didn't even block that. See, now I can't get smacked by this 50-50 overhead shenanigans. Now we're going to talk about another really important block direction thing. So you remember how I mentioned earlier that if you block a high attack... Me. Let me demonstrate this again. Got it. Damn. Let me put... Pap in the corner so this is easy to demonstrate again. If you block a high attack... There will be a replay on YouTube, yeah. If you block a high attack, and you let go of block, it saves your block direction, right? So I can block a second high attack, even though I, um... I'm no longer blocking, as long as I put a uh, push block. This. Oh, save it. Why didn't it save my thing? Uh, like that. Alright, let's, let's use that recording. So, it, normally if I let go of block, I'm gonna get smacked. But, if I push block and I let go of block, it saves the direction I blocked. 
until the end of push block. So I can use this to my advantage. As I said earlier, if you do the same thing and they use a different direction, so they go high into low, for example, it doesn't save the blocking direction. Now what this means is, because it saves my high block direction, I can actually switch to a different direction and still block... Like, I can switch from high to low block and still block high while blocking low. To demonstrate this, I'm gonna do the same string again, right? That, jump B into overhead. Now, if I push block the jump B, what would normally happen is if I block the jump B and I switch to low block, like this, I get hit by the overhead, right? But, if I push block and then I switch to low block, even though I'm blocking low, and I'm gonna prove to you that I am blocking low by doing it here, too. Even though I'm blocking low, I'm also blocking high at the same time. I'm blocking both directions at once. This is a very, very, very powerful defensive tool. It's called Absolute Guard. And it is one of your best defense against all of the really fast overheads and mix-ups in this game. That overhead from Paprika is like 18 frame startup. But... If Paprika's pressuring me with, like, let's say she does 2A, she's doing 2A overhead, right? And then she's also mixing that up with, let's go into recording number 2, she's mixing that up with 2A, 2A. I can block both of these with the same sequence. I can block both of these by push blocking the first hit. Why? Why is it doing that string? I can block low, push block, and then switch to high block. And that way, I am actually able to block both strings. So that's low low. It's low low. What is going on? Okay. Let's hit it about the same time, yeah. I'm able to block both strings here. Using the same sequence of inputs. Oops. This is a little bit sloppy, but... There it is. Low into high. I low block, push block, high block. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing low block, push block, into high block. And I'm able to block the low into overhead. And I'm able to block the low into low. With the same string of inputs, both ways. Is there a downside to using Absolute Guard? I'm going to get into that when I talk about how to deal with push block when you're on offense. But for now, keep in mind that Absolute Guard is a thing, and it's one of the best things about push block. Avoid chip out scenarios, we discussed this earlier. I don't think I need to go over it too much, but um... If you have... 300 health or less. They 6A twice and then hit you with an overhead? What do you mean? You mean 2A? Crouching A? Like this? They do that string? That? Um, that actually also loses to Absolute Guard. Let's see. The only reason that that would hit me is if I didn't switch to high block. Now, we're gonna discuss how to play around this once we get to dealing with push block on offense, but for now, keep in mind it's a good defensive tool. So, avoiding chip outs, if you have 300 health or less, we set my health to like 1%, 3%. So, if I block this string normally, if I block this string normally, you see that I lose a little chunk of health. But if I push block, I don't lose any health. So you can use this to avoid chip out scenarios. Of course, if they do this, push block won't save you because you have to block the move before you push block it. 
But if they're trying to do a push block, if they're trying to do a block string into a chip out, you're safe. And now, this bit here. Remember when I said earlier that, like, uh, when you push block, you have to press these buttons, right? You're pressing some combination of these three buttons. A, B, C. If you're not in block stun, you will actually do a different attack, right? You might do throw if you're push blocking with B, C. You might do jab if you're pushing with uh, A, B, or A, C. Now what this means is that technically you are option selecting a different move every time that you push block. Which means that, for example, if the opponent comes at me with a jump C, and I push block it, I get push block. But if they come at me with empty jump, and I try to push block it, I might grab them. Or I might hit them. So because of that, there are a lot of different things you can do. Every time you push block, you are potentially doing a move in case you are not in block stun. Why are people always slamming doors in my house? This is like a recurring problem. Um, I don't know why I did 10% health there, but alright. So, let's say I want to push block. Alright, I'm just gonna make Pap do a move that I can push block so I can demonstrate how all these different inputs work. So, A, B. If I do both at the same time, I get A. Because when you press two buttons at the same time, the lighter normal takes priority. So I push block with A, B. If I am not in block stun, I'll get crouching A or standing A. If I push block with A, C. If I'm not in block stun, I will get crouching A, assuming that I time them at the same time. Or standing A. And then if I hit them, it will come out as AC. Same with AB. If I hit them, it will come out as AB. And then if I push block with BC, I will get grab. So this is me push blocking with BC, and this is me getting grab when I'm not in block stun. Now, if you know what plinking is, you can actually plink different normals for your defensive push blocks. So normally, if I do A, B on the same frame, like if I'm doing a macro, I will get standing A, right? But if I press B slightly before A, you can hear I'm, two, I'm pressing two buttons there. And you can see on my inputs that I'm pressing B slightly before A. Now if I push block with that, If I can. There we go. It's a bit tough to time, but it does work. This is like an advanced thing that you can do. Well, I am not good at timing this apparently. What's going on here? I know this works. Alright, it's a bit tougher than I initially thought, but that is a thing you can do. You can also do this with um, the grab OS. You see, normally, when you press two buttons slightly apart into grab when you're standing, you'll actually get a Kara throw, where the first two frames of your attack are cancelled into the throw. You can see the swipe from Oleander's 5B here. You can see it up here, even though I interrupted the 5B with my throw. But if I do the same input while crouching, where I'm pressing B slightly before C, I'll actually get a throw tech push block 2B option select. So this option select, if I'm crouching and I press this, I'll get 2B, right? If I block something and I press this, I'll get push block. And then, let's say the opponent does empty jump into throw, right? Because they're trying to catch me doing something. They're trying to, you know, do some tomfoolery. That was me doing the same input. 
This is the input I'm doing. I'm getting 2B on whiff. I'm getting throw tech if I get thrown. And if they hit me with a normal, I'm getting push lock. This is probably the most useful one, depending on your character. A lot of characters have anti-air 2Bs. So for example, if you're playing Oleander, this is an okay anti-air normal. It's very fast. It doesn't have upper body invuln, but it's very fast and it hits very high and pretty far. If you're Palm, for example, you've got her godlike 2B. If you're playing Tianwo, you've got her 2B, which is a pretty decent anti-air. If you're a character that has a really good anti-air 2B, this option select right here is probably your best friend. And of course, you can also option select it with 2C if you really want to. If your character has a good 2C, for example, if you're playing Velvet, you might want to uh, push block, throw tech, 2C option select. The main goal here is that you're not caught whiffing a throw, and you're actually doing a useful move that can hit the opponent on block. Because as we'll discuss in the offensive section of this lesson here, the throw tech OS by itself is probably the weakest one. It is the most exploitable one. And I think that's a very good segue into the offensive push block uh, lesson here. Throws on techable when crouching? No, you can tech throws while crouching. It used to be like that, but they changed it. Now you can tech throws while crouching. Alright. So let's... pick a more offense-oriented character. Let's say Arizona. Let's fight against Velvet. Now let's... Let's do Tianwo versus Paprika. And let's go to Arizona stage. So, in them's fighting herds, let me set them so they're not push blocking, blocking always, push block after and ever, okay. So, in them's fighting herds, almost every attack in the game, there are very few exceptions to this, almost every attack in the game is minus on block. See down there, I'm minus one, I'm negative. I'm at a disadvantage if they block this and I do nothing after. They recover one frame before I do. My 2A, minus four. They recover four frames before I do. 5B, they recover 4 frames, 2B, they recover 5 frames, 5C, they recover 6 frames faster, 2C, they recover 24 frames faster, you know, it's it's just a mess. All these moves are unsafe, not unsafe, but they're all negative, and that means that the opponent can often challenge me if they block these moves outright and do nothing after. So normally, it would not be my turn, unless, you know, I flight cancel and I go into pressure, because these are plus on block when you flight cancel them, plus two, plus five, etc. But um, let's say I'm just doing grounded strings. Nah, uh, it doesn't need to be a neutral direction. Um, so this moves minus four normally, right? But if the opponent push blocks me, even though I get pushed far away, I am now plus six. So, let me set the opponent to just chill here for a sec. Just set it to save load state, so I stop getting them attacking me. Alright. Here I am, plus six. So, instead of being minus four, I'm actually, now, plus six. Even though I'm farther away, I am plus. The opponent cannot challenge my 5B if I do another one. Because they don't have a move that's fast enough to interrupt this. Fastest normals in the game are 5 frames. And I'm plus 6. My 5B is 9 frame startup. Which means they need a move that's like 2 frames or faster to interrupt me. And they just don't have it. No character in the game has that except maybe Arizona Super. But that's invincible so it's not like it matters. Um, so it's my turn. Even though they push blocked me, even though I'm slightly farther away, unless I do a move that's unsafe on whiff without thinking about it, I'm still at the advantage. So here, I'm only plus one and I'm a lot farther away, right? Because heavy normals have a lot more blocks done, which means that the difference that push block is going to make isn't going to be very high, because they already have high amounts of blocks done and push block just adds 25 frames replaces your normal blocks down with 25, I should say. So if this move has like, you know, it's something like, I don't know, 
20 frames a block stun. If that becomes 25 frames a block stun, it's not that big a difference. But if it's, say, for example, a jab, minus one, that's like maybe 15 frames a block stun at most. If they push block this, I'm plus eight. And I'm closer because light normals do not get push blocked very far. So I'm plus eight at a very abusable range. At this range, I could do dash up throw. At this range, I could do dash up 2A. At this range, I might even try to go for my overhead. Because my overhead does have pretty decent range, as you can see. There it is. So I'm still at a good range here. I can still put on the pressure here. No, even though they push blocked me, it's still my turn. I'm still close enough to keep the pressure going. The other important thing to know is that um, if you do additional attacks during the push block stun, it actually halts your momentum. So normally I would go this far back, right? But if I do a second move, I am a bit closer because it halted my momentum. Now, because of the fact that the end of push block stun will shave off block stun from extra moves, I'm not nearly as added advantage. Like here, I'm plus three on a normal 2B, but if I do 2B here, I'm minus eight. So, doing multi hits like that might not always be the best answer. It's often better to do single attacks. If your opponent is always push blocking after the first move, it's often a good strategy to keep doing single attacks like this. But if your opponent is mashing push block, like every attack, then you're not really at any risk for going for multi-hit strings like this to stay close. Like here I can use this to stay close and then go for a string, right? I can go for an overhead after that. Or for example, let's say... I do an air normal because air normals often get push blocked pretty far. I do an air normal into this and then I'm close enough to keep going for my overhead. Like let's say if they push block this, I might not be at the best range to go for 40 jump A for example, which is faster than 40 jump B. Because 40 jump A is faster but it has less range. If I go for an instant air dash into an overhead, I'm not close enough anymore. But if I do instant air dash 5B into my overhead, I am close enough because the second normal actually stalled their push block momentum. Now, this makes push block not look as strong as it would otherwise be, yet, but you have to keep in mind the absolute guard. You have to keep in mind the fact that push block, um, like, yeah. I can always do this, but uh, if they're actually varying up their push block timings and I'm just doing 1-5-A, I'm minus here, and you know, it, it all comes down to recognizing your opponent's push block habits, because there's different counters for different things. Because like, if I think they're not push blocking and I go for a multi-hit string like this, and then all of a sudden I'm minus 8, right? I'm minus 8 here, right? Or better yet, I'm minus 9 if I do this multi-hit string here, right? If I'm not recognizing their habits and I'm doing multi-hit strings, I might get punished, right? That's a punish right there, I'm trying to block. And then, if they're not push blocking and I'm trying to do single hit strings, right? Let's say they're not push blocking, and I'm trying to do single hit strings because I think they're going to push block. So let's record slot 2. Right? I'm doing a, a single hit string, and I'm trying to dash up to continue my pressure. I'm getting counter hit. So it comes down to recognizing your opponent's habits here. You have to remember, you have to keep in mind what they're trying to do. It's kind of hard to react to the push block itself. So oftentimes you'll be making these decisions before the push block even happens. But it's um if you use it wrong, it can get you punished. Like I might try to keep up my air dash pressure. Let's say I'm Tianwo and I'm trying to air dash pressure here. Because I think they're gonna push block my uh air normal because I know that they think that fuzzy guard is scary. Now let's say 
they recognize this. They recognize that I'm not playing around the push block, right? They recognize that I'm just doing my normal pressure. I'm not caring. I'm not going for the fuzzy guard because I think they're going to push block. I'm air dashing again to stay close. There I am. I got anti-aired, right? Now, if I recognize that habit, I can counter hit them, but... Or I can actually fuzzy guard them better, let's say. I can go for my fuzzy guard if they're not push blocking. There's a lot of different things that you can do here. But the base, the basic uh, thing I want to get across is that push block makes certain types of pressure weaker and certain types of pressure stronger. For example, the thing that best, uh, that push block best counters is um, whiff punishable moves. Like, let's say you're canceling into a whiff punishable move. Let me set them to push block here. I can get across what I'm talking about. Let's say I push block, they push block this, I'm negative 36, right? And it's also good against multi-hit strings like this that aren't cancelled into anything. As we demonstrated earlier, if I set Paprika to do her 9 frame cartwheel A, and I do this string, which is minus 9 if I hit their push block, I get punished. Because push block does shave some block stun off of second hits in the push block stun. But, of course, if I recognize that they're doing that, if I just do a 5B, I'm plus 6, which means that I can do 5B, 5B, and counter hit their cart A. Something you'll often see Paprikas do is push block into cart A, because it is so fast and it does often punish those strings, and it also works as a pretty good anti-air. But, if you, you know, if I'm doing a delayed flight cancel thing, I might get hit. If I'm doing air dash into air dash, I might get hit. But if I recognize that they're doing this, I can just stop my pressure here, B plus 6, and just smack them with 5C or 5B or whatever. You know? There's a lot of things I could do. I could do dash up throw and still hit them. Stuff like that. So playing around push block is very complicated. There's a lot of things that you can do to counteract a lot of the things that push block does. So... For example, alright, we talked about this. Testing your PB scenarios, this is just as simple as, um, heading into training, set the dummy to block always, set them to push block after the first hit, or the second hit, or the third hit, whichever hit you want. Um, if you're using multi-hit moves, like palms jump B, you'll have to figure out which hit is the most push blockable. Usually you want to push block the last hit of a multi-hit move like that, but, um, Basically, you can test which of your normals are good on push block. So that these are the normals that you use when the opponent is push blocking a lot on, like, first hit. Because it's very hard to stop the opponent from push blocking outright. We're going to discuss a few ways to try to deal with that. But, um, ideally opponents will be reacting and push blocking. And now keep in mind that these are the best case frame data. Um, this is them push blocking immediately. Some people will push block late. You can push block as far into block stun as block stun lasts, so you can actually do a late push block. And that will increase the attacker's frame advantage even more, because you're adding those 25 frames of block stun later into the move. So if my opponent, for example, is push blocking this later into the block stun, I might be upwards of plus 20. So that'll give me even more of a chance to go for pressure after. If they push block an air normal late, yeah, I'm plus 17 right now at this distance, but if they push block late, I might be like plus 30. Stuff like that. So, go into training mode and see what your worst case scenarios are. These are your worst case push block frame data. My worst case 2B is a plus 3 if they push block the 2B. So I know that this isn't the best move to try to continue pressure after push blocking, because it makes me go pretty far. It's only plus three, but this one, plus six, right? I'm plus six, I'm at this distance. I'm sure if I set the dummy to do a reversal jab, all right, that's not quite a reversal jab. Let's see if we can get a good one. That looks pretty good. 
Yeah, there we go. I know that's still my turn after this, uh... Assuming I do things well. There we go. I'm in range for 2A. It's basically my turn. I can do another 5B. That's the, that's the good thing to know, is that if your character has good normals, you know that long-range normals lead to big damage in this game. It's not hard to get a good combo going from a long-range normal. Oh, damage. <laughs> the uh, health was set to too low to actually show the full damage of that combo, but if you played this game for a few minutes, you know that long-range normals lead to big damage. You know that most characters can convert off their ranged normals. But, um, yeah. So, you go into training mode, maybe set the opponent to do an action on reversal. A good one to test is, uh, Pap's Cartwheel A, especially if you're trying to learn the Pap matchup, because this is a common thing for them to do. Stuff like that. See that I'm plus three there, but if I do five C, I'm like minus. No, I'm, I'm plus one, which means it's very hard to challenge this, because you know maybe five A will counter it, maybe not. If I do two C, they push block. I'm downright punishable. Stuff like that. So it's good to test which of your normals are good on PB. Like I know my air normals are good. All the air normals. Push block has this weird relationship with air normals because um. Air normals are as plus as you are when you land from them, and they do a lot of block stun usually. Like, if I do instant air dash jump C and they push block, I'm plus 23. Sure, I'm pretty far, but also I'm plus 23, so it's definitely still my turn. Assuming I get good pressure. Yeah, like that. It's still my turn. Even though I'm sent all this distance, it's still my turn. I can still dash up throw and counter hit what they're doing. So even though it's necessary to push block air normals to avoid fuzzy guard break, um, they're also still really good if they are push blocked. So it's good to keep that in mind, that you can keep your pressure going, even if you get push blocked while you're doing an air normal. Alright. Speaking of defensive mechanics, absolute guard. How do you deal with it? How do you stop absolute guard? So as I stated, um, absolute guard... It, it only lasts as long as the push block lasts. So I'm gonna set the dummy to do the same string that I uh, able to absolute guard before. So. No, not that. Is this. I'm able to absolute guard that, right? I can absolute guard that. Now, your natural tendency is to switch back to low block, or high block, or whatever you think the opponent is going to do, after the push block ends. So the opponent can actually abuse this by delaying their mix-up so that it it's after push block ends, right? So that was me switching back to low block after the push block ended. So I recognized that she was still in range for a low, because I push blocked a light. And I had absolute guard up for my push block, so I figured I was safe from an overhead. But, because she delayed the overhead so late... I got smacked. And of course she could also do... Dash up low after that. So if I'm expecting the overhead or I'm being sloppy with my absolute guard input and I'm still holding up, or high block, I get hit low. So the main way that you deal with absolute guard is to just delay your mix up so that it would hit after push block ends. That is really the only way to stop absolute guard if it's already activated. You can't stop it once it's activated, you have to try to hit them after it ends. Absolute guard the same as it was in Skullgirls? I assume so. It's where you push block and you switch block directions, and it lets you block both high and low at the same time, as long as push block is still active. If that's how it worked in Skullgirls, then it's how it works in this game. So... 
testing for the opponent's push block OS. So as I explained earlier, you can push block with a lot of different things. You can push block with crouching B throw tech OS, assuming that you are using uh, a plink crouch normal. If you try to plink it while standing, you'll just get a car throw. But you know, you can do this. Most people will either do A, A and then B or C, so they'll whiff a jab if they're not in block stun, or they'll do the throw tech OS with B, C. A lot of people do B, C because it's easy to have one macro for both throw and push block. It's very comfortable. I still do it myself. It's a bad habit. And I'm going to explain why. So the thing that push block relies on is you to be in block stun for it to activate, right? It's a good defensive mechanic, but it only works if you're actually blocking something. And oftentimes, there are situations where you think the opponent is going to hit you, and your instinct is to push block them as soon as possible. Like, let's say Paprika jumps at me, right? That's... Hello? Paprika jumps at me. I want her off of me, right? Get off me. So I'm using the throw tech OS. Now what Paprika can do, she can do an empty hop at me, right? And then do another short hop. So here's what's going to happen here. I think she's going to short hop C. Because I see her short hop at me. I assume she's doing an attack. And it's my instinct to hit my push block macro. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get smacked. Because I'm doing my delayed button. I'm trying to option select my throw tech. I'm trying to option select my push block. I'm getting counter hit. So what you can do is you can actually do setups like this. You can just empty jump. Probably the best way to test this is to just empty jump at the opponent and block and be ready to tech a throw. That is the best way to test what your opponent's... Uh, push block option select is. Because when you jump towards the opponent, it's generally speaking, either they're going to anti-air you, or they're going to block you and then try to push block. Because they, they want to push block air normals. It's very good to push block air normals because of fuzzy guard. You don't want to get fuzzy guard broken, you push block your air normals. So you just empty jump at the opponent and see what they do. If you're ready to tech the throw, you tech the throw, you're plus one because you tech the throw. The person who techs throws is plus one. Um, and you recognize that their push block OS is the throw tech OS. And from then on, you can start doing stuff like, you know, you can mix up between actually doing the thing or you can intentionally go for empty jump pressure into throw invulnerable attacks like short hops and just beat them up for not push blocking properly. Of course, they might also be push blocking with something like uh let's let's set the dummy to jump at me again with an empty jump. Right? They're empty jumping at me. I'm push blocking with AB. Still have the dummy doing all this stuff right now. Let me just set them to nothing. Um people might also be push blocking with AB, right? And that is a lot harder to stop. It's harder to stop because um, the way that you punish throws is just by doing like a rising air normal or by, you know, backdashing. But if the opponent is option selecting with like, maybe they're double tapping AB so that they get jab jab, that way you can't backdash it. You can't really backdash jab jabs most of the time. Like, I'm going to set the dummy to do that actually. You can't really push block. You can't really uh, get out of that way. Blech. You can't really stop that using a back dash or an empty jump or something like that. It's not as easy to punish. This is something that I still have yet to figure out how to properly deal with. I think the correct response is to just do stuff like empty jump 2A, empty jump 5A, or do a really late air, air normal. Like that. Because people will usually expect you to hit them by then. You might do that. You might do, uh, let's say, empty jump 5A. Too close. Too close. 
He's very hard to deal with because five A's are five frame startup, and therefore you have four frames to hit them out of it for it to be a proper punish. So, when you're dealing with the opponent's push blocking habits, you want to gauge it by empty jumping and then be ready to throw tech. So let me set the dummy to do that. Do like an empty jump into throw tech. And then if they're using throw tech OS, you'll tech the throw. And if they're using AB OS, you'll probably push block them. You'll just recognize that you blocked their normal. And from then on, you can try to figure out what your offensive game plan should be from there. You know, going for, let's say you go for something like a, uh, a really delayed jump A. Stop this. I just get a full jump? Oh my goodness. Wow. As you can see, timing this sort of thing would take a little bit of practice, but you could definitely do it. Yeah, there's, there's the delayed jump A. I'm gonna try to block that, and I'm gonna try to push block with A, B. Like that. You have to structure your offense around what they're gonna do. If they're specifically using 2A, jump over probably works. Um, yeah, that assumes that they switch to low block before hitting PB, but they're unlikely to do that because they want to activate Absolute Guard. So they'll probably do a stand push block into a crouching push block. But they do stand block into crouch, so that they get Absolute Guard from push blocking your air normal. How do you record and play dummy inputs? You have to go into training mode. You go to the select button option down here. You s it's, it's save load state by default. You switch it to dummy record playback. And there's different recording numbers. You can record up to three different things. You can set them to play randomly. And you just hit your select button. Whatever that is. Whatever you balance your select button to be. And if you want to erase it, you either hold A and D and press select again, or you hold select until the screen flashes red. That's how you do that. Now, depending on your character, um, you might have different mid-range options for dealing with push block. For example, let's say... Probably the most common example would be Arizona. Arizona has the whole thing going where she has her stomps and her rope, which means that if the opponent is push blocking you, chances are you can actually put them into a mix-up scenario. Let's say they push block this 5C, right? I'm at the perfect range to go for a rope or a stomp. Stomp a mix-up, right? And that's a pretty strong mid-range option. So, I can only really do this if I am cognizant of what they're push blocking, right? I can't do this off of an A normal. I have to specifically looking be looking for them to push block a heavy normal. You know, this is the kind of thing that you need to be paying attention to, and this is the kind of thing that you need to lab out for your character specifically. You gotta see... If they push block this normal, what can I do after it to keep my pressure going? Are there any normals that I should be careful not to cancel into? Like for example, right there, I canceled into 5C from- I canceled into 5- five, I canceled into 2C from 5A. And I recognize that if I do that and I whiff, I'm minus 18, right? So now, I know that I shouldn't do that, because this might happen. Stuff like that. This is the kind of thing that you gotta open up training mode if you want to learn more about. You just gotta set the dummy to push block, you gotta see what the frame data says, you have to understand what moves you should be cancelling into. 
Like, that was relatively safe to whiff. Especially if I whiff it early. Or if I do it late, I might get smacked by, like, a jab or something. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But... If you're playing from the offensive side, a lot of it has to do with trying the waters, seeing what your opponent's push block OS is, and then trying to punish them for what they're doing. Seeing if they're push block OSing with a button, it could be doing the crouch B1, which is easier to counter hit than the stand A1. They could be doing the throw one, which is really easy to counter just by doing rising normals. Like, I could set the dummy to completely screw me over right now if they, uh, if they wanted to. Do empty jump, double jump, jump B, jump C. And I get smacked for that. I might also get smacked for doing 5A, if they do it at the right height. Oleander in particular is really good at stopping push block with her double jump. Just, oh, uh, something to note. A lot of different characters have options like this. Tianwo can maybe use her flight or her dive kicks to punish bad push blocks. Um... It depends on your air mobility if you're going for jump-ins. On the ground, it's a bit harder. You can actually try to... Um, vary your string timing to try to counter-hit people who are doing late push blocks, because oftentimes when people do late push blocks, they're relying on the fact that you're putting them into a second normal. So, like, let's say... I do that, right? Let's say Oleander does... 2A, 2A, like that. And I want to push block the second 2A. Now, oftentimes I'm not going to react to that. I'm just going to wait a second and then push block. Now, let's say she does 2A, 5B. 5B is a much slower normal. Now, if all goes well for Oleander, she does her delayed 5B. I try to push block the second 2A. Maybe not. Maybe not. Alright, this is a bit harder than it looks. Countering push block on the ground isn't easy, I'll tell you that much. It's basically like frame trapping, but even harder. The best push block blades are done from the air, I'll tell you that much. It's, it's easiest to bait a push block if you're going for an air option. Because air options are the ones that people are most likely to want to push block because of Fuzzy Guard. And the um, option selects are weakest to air options. So if you want to defeat push block, you have to look. If you want to punish push block attempts, you have to go for air options and play from there. And if you want to punish the opponent for using push block on the ground, you have to pay attention to what your situation is after getting push blocked and just use that to extend your pressure. Because the opponent can do this all day and it's still my turn, and eventually I'm going to hit them with the overhead, you know? It's a very nuanced offensive situation, and it's probably the most complicated thing, and trying to talk about it here on this stream, there's a lot of stuff that could be discussed. But it's important to know that a lot of this is going to come down to uh, testing in training mode or just feeling the waters in actual matches. Basic knowledge, like knowing that A normals are usually plus if they get push blocked and they usually leave you close. Knowing that if you get a second normal push blocked, it's probably not your turn anymore unless you string into a normal frame trap. Stuff like that. On defense, it's a lot easier. Defense, I gotta say push block. The push block situation is a lot easier for the defender than it is for the attacker. Because the defender just has to keep in mind what option select they're using, what it's weak to, uh, what normals they want to push block. And, you know, a lot of people can just mash push block when they get put in blocks done and be fine. A lot of smarter players will be looking for those whiff punishes that I discussed earlier, where, you know... I whiff that, and then Oleander hits me with the super because she recognized that I whiffed it, stuff like that. Defender doesn't have to worry about 
pressuring after knowing the frame data of all their moves. Stuff like that. Um... I think... I'm pretty much done here. The whole push block and offense section here, it has the fewest bullet points, but I think it's the part that we spent the most time on because of how complicated the whole situation is. But just know that push block makes most of your light and mediums plus. If you get push blocked from an air normal, it's still your turn. Um, generally speaking, you might want to see what your scenario is after certain normals. Like, okay, I'm plus eight at this range if they push block my jab. I'm plus two at this range if they push block my 5C. That's not really usable, so I should maybe go for some mid-range pressure, stuff like that. You should know that PB momentum is interrupted by multiple hits. You might think this is good until you realize that push block shaves off some block stun of the second move. So I'm going from... This move is normally minus two. I'm going to minus five at uh, this range, which is not good for Arizona. You know, stuff like that. You gotta realize that absolute guard is a thing, uh, and you can counter it by just delaying your low or overhead so that it hits after push block ends, so that the mix-up is still there. And, you know, you can use empty jumps, you can do stuff like this, you can do empty jump into rising short hop if you're Oleander. I did this earlier. You can test for their option select. By doing things that will dodge throws, or doing, for example, you know, empty jump into throw tech. That way, if they do A, B, you just push block it, and if they do grab OS, you tech it, and then you know what their option select is. From then on, you can build your offense around that. And yeah, and from then on, you can attempt to punish their push block habits. Yeah. Push block, grab OS is definitely the easiest to counter, as I said earlier, because it loses to just rise normals. But, um, A, B is probably the hardest one to punish, because you have four frame window to counter hit it out of that, out of them. And this is assuming that they are even trying to push block when they recognize that they're not in block stun. Really good players will only push block when they react to something, and then you have to do things like, uh, use specific normals that have a really low amount of block stun to try to fool them into push blocking at a point where they can't. Like, for example, if you try to push block this, you'll find that the, uh, let me, let me show you how low the block stun is on this. Look at how short the block stun is. So oftentimes people will try to react to that and push block it and Oleander can get a counter hit for it. Let me, let me do better pressure than that. Oh. You get the picture. Stuff like Tianwo's jump A. Most characters' jump A's have this. Um, if you're Palm and you air dash cancel your jump B before the final hit, you'll often get a situation like that where the opponent will try to push block even though they reacted to a move and they just can't because the block stun is so short. Um, Arizona's jump A, for example, has very short block stun. Paprika's jump A. That is probably the most useful tidbit when it comes to trying to punish an opponent who is literally only ever push blocking when they react to the fact that they're in block stun, which is the best time to push block. That is a really good player if they're only ever push blocking then and they're not instinctually pressing their button because they think you're attacking them. Um, those are the people that are the hardest to crack open when it comes to push block, but there is a way around it. Every character has a move that can possibly trick that kind of player into whiffing a push block. Most characters. Um, maybe not all. But, you know, you've got maybe Velvet's jump B, like the first hit of her jump B that hits, uh, grounded opponents. You've got Palm's jump B, you've got Arizona's jump A and short hop C, you've got Tianwo's jump A, you have uh, Oleander's traps and jump A. Stuff like that. So, that's a bit of knowledge that you can use 
to try to open up good PBers with low block stun attacks. See? We completed the list. See, we added one more to this very bare-bones list on how to deal with push block on offense. But yeah, um... I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover here. I'm not gonna bother with a summary. If you want a review, just go watch the rest of the stuff again. Um... Basically, you know, push block is pretty good. It has ways to work around it. Um... Both the push blocker and the opponent getting push blocked have to think at least a little bit. The push blocker doesn't have to think as much as the opponent countering it, but, you know. The person on defense can, you know, they can look for whiff punishes, they can look to avoid uh, fuzzies, they can use absolute guard. The opponent on offense has to deal with actually cracking the opponent open who's using push block, but because offense is really strong in this game, uh, having a strong defensive option that everyone has access to for free, like this, is actually a pretty nice balance, I would say. Especially when there is counterplay to it, depending on which move is being push-blocked and what your character is. Like, if you're a zoner, you don't really care about getting push-blocked a lot of the time. Like, yeah, they'll negate some of your chip damage, but if you have the life lead, that's just screen positioning for you. Um, it, it all depends, but at the end of the day, there are ways around it, and, you know, it, it's a good defensive option. Are there any more... Are there any questions about this particular mechanic? This is question time, so if you have any questions, hit me with them questions. How big is Arizona? Very small, not big. A quick TMS shill? Ah, yes. Um... Probably gonna cut the look. No, no, I'm not gonna cut the local recording here. But, um... TMS, The Magic Series, number 4, 2020. It's happening next Saturday, same time as this stream. Big ol' tournament. Cash prizes, uh, cash prizes on the line, also raffles for both viewers and participants. Uh, you know, I believe there's t-shirts being raffled, there's game keys being raffled, stuff like that. For some reason I can't see anything? Hmm. T-shirts are not being raffled. Pins are! Okay! I'm a liar, t-shirts are not being raffled. T-shirts are prizes for top players. Pins are being raffled. Got some of that sick merchandise from Main 6 that they recently came out with. Awesome. I actually have some of it at home already. I gotta say, they are very nice pins. So, if you're interested in watching the stream, being part of the raffle, go check that out next weekend. If you're interested in participating, head to the Fight and Fanatics Discord. Uh, we have links in the chat for the bracket. If you type exclamation point bracket in the chat right now, you'll get a link to the bracket. I believe it has a player cap of 128 players, so if you want to get in, get in while the getting's good. Ah uh, yes, this Combo Breaker retrospective stream is happening. So... Discord link? Discord link is in the bracket description, I believe. We'll be raiding. Uh... I think I know how to raid. <laughs> yes, get in while the getting's good. But yeah, um... I think we're just about done here, unless someone has any questions about push block in particular. Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't seem like there's any questions. Yeah, 
I, th I think I covered just about everything there is to really know about push block, you know, absolute guard, the mechanics behind the block stun, distance, option selects, chip outs, all that. There's a lot of stuff, but with all this knowledge you should be able to improve both your offense and defense as a TFH player and recognize the kind of counterplay that goes into defending and attacking in a game that's as hectic as this one. It may seem chaotic, it may seem like people are just doing strings and mashing push block, but there is a lot more that goes to it than just that. And uh, yeah. Maybe incorporate that into your own gameplay and become the push block or anti-push block or both master. So uh, yeah. How do we raid? 5x5, five five. are you doing that? Do I have to end the stream before we raid? Or does the raid happen when I end the stream? I don't actually know. But yeah, uh, thanks for joining me this evening. Hopefully y'all learned a lot. And I'm gonna cut it here. Be sure to check out the stream next weekend for the tournament. And see you then. Bye.